So we've got a rich uh, set of issues uh, to deal with. Um, I'll introduce our panellists as they step up, except they don't really need uh, uh, much introduction. We're going to start with Ambassador Michael Froman, who's the trade representative for the United States of America, who's negotiated the TPP and TTIP. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to, you could sit there or you can stand at the, at the podium. Up to you. Maybe I'll sit here and, and just uh, summarize my remarks since I know we're, we're short on time. Uh, first of all, it, it is good to be here. It is interesting that the Munich Security Conference has evolved in such a direction that it not only deals with security, but even occasionally allows a trade minister to come. And uh, hopefully that doesn't, is not seen as lowering the overall level of, uh, of, of, of quality of the uh, participation. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, over time, economics has become more and more central uh, to security, and it's not just been as a basis for military power, but as a form of influence itself. And of course, Europe is a particular example of how moving from reconstruction to integration to expansion has really been a major expression of political will being translated into economic power and beyond. Uh, we know there are a lot of challenges uh, in this effort, and TTIP was intended to deal with some of these challenges. Uh, it was born in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis when policymakers were looking for cost-free drivers of growth. And since then, of course, we've seen uh, um, uh, economic progress uh, in uh, the United States uh, and, and uh, uh, pro across much of Europe, although growth remains uh, weak and uneven in certain places, and there are still serious issues uh, to deal with. Um, the U.S.-EU relationship already has a strong foundation. Two billion dollars of goods, a billion dollars of services are traded across the Atlantic uh, every day. We've got four trillion dollars in mutual investment. It supports 14 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. And our view is, is that a trade agreement like TTIP, first and foremost, has to rest on its economic merits, on its ability to support longer-term growth, more opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses, more opportunities for uh, workers, and a, an ability to maintain and enhance competitiveness in an increasingly uh, competitive world. But alongside the economic rationale is the strategic rationale uh, for TTIP, and that has only grown stronger with the geopolitical developments on the margins of Europe over the last few years. And those include diversifying markets, enhancing energy security potentially, and most importantly, reinforcing the transatlantic relationship. Some of the biggest strategic gains that can come from TTIP is actually the U.S. and the EU working together to help shape what is a rapidly changing world. And while it's easy to get caught up in the details of this project on issues like cheese names, for example, uh, when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, uh, perhaps what's most distinctive about TTIP is the opportunity it provides for the two of us to work together to elevate global standards. Uh, this is a, a chance uh, to raise our collective game and, in doing so, play a leadership role together in defining new rules of the road for the open rules-based trading system. And I emphasize that because it was American and European leadership after the Second World War that brought this global trading system into being, developed it, has been leading it, and the rest of the world, as they saw its advantages and that greater openness meant greater opportunity, uh, they came on board, and with that growth, came major progress towards reducing extreme poverty around the world, and that in itself has enhanced our global security. But the system that we've all benefited so much from is coming under strains, whether it's globalization, technological change, uh, the changing composition of, of global production have reshaped the global economy and continues to reshape it. And right now there are alternative visions being put forward for the global economy as well. And in these alternative visions, uh, sometimes the state is absent where it should be present and is present where it should be absent. And rather than promoting fair competition, uh, there are at times excessive subsidies. Uh, rather than building bridges for innovation, countries are tempted to put up walls to prevent the free flow of ideas. Uh, and rather than focusing on the importance of enhancing labor and environmental protections, uh, countries are tempted to go for short-term gains rather than for long-term uh, benefits. Uh, we're here in Germany, which is doing quite well economically, but none of us should take for granted 
uh, be complacent about the current situation because the system on which we rely um, is one that is very much under stress and we have to be proactive and play a leadership role uh, together in making sure that it develops in the right direction. For our part, the United States, we are very much engaged in that effort and last year uh, President Obama demonstrated his willingness to expend significant political capital on trade as we secured trade promotion authority. Recently we brought 12 nations together to complete the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which in our view is the highest standard trade agreement ever negotiated. Uh, it includes, among other things, the strongest enforceable labor and environmental provisions uh, in history. The first rules to keep the internet open and fair. The first rules to level the playing field between state-owned enterprises and private firms. And these standards will now cover 40% of the global economy and the of countries who've expressed interest in potentially joining it. But as we continue to work to continue to upgrade the open rules-based trading system, we want to lead with Europe side by side as two advanced, high-wage, high-standard economies. And this is based on the fact that we have common aspirations. We know we don't completely agree on every issue, but we're closer in our values to each other than we are to anyone else. And we believe, for example, that growth by itself is not enough, that creating growth that's sustainable and inclusive is important, uh, not by sacrificing standards, but by raising them, not by reducing protections for workers in the environment, uh, but by enhancing them. And by getting TTIP done, we can show the world that a more ambitious model of growth is possible and give further impetus to the multilateral trading system uh, itself. In our view, now is the time. After making steady progress for the past two and a half years, we've got the opportunity to bring these negotiations to a successful close, and the Obama administration is prepared to make every effort to conclude uh, TTIP. But to do so, both sides are going to need to show the necessary political will. We understand the strains and stresses Europe is under, uh, the refugee and mi migrant crisis, the risk of Brexit, the overhang of the global financial crisis, and there's a lot at stake in how Europe addresses those issues. Uh, just to take one, obviously the decision about the UK's role in Europe is uh, very much up to the British people, but as President Obama has said, we value a strong UK in the EU, and a unified, strong, and confident Europe is very much in the interest of the United States and the broader international community. Finally, let me just say that TTIP, in our view, provides an opportunity at a time when the headlines here are replete with challenges. And no group of people is better positioned to understand and explain what's at stake than those uh, in this room. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ignacio uh, Bacero sits on the other side of the table as the uh, head of the, uh, the, the trade directorate at uh, the uh, European Commission. And I suppose, um, are you quite that optimistic? Uh, yes, I think I would agree with everything that Ambassador Fromant uh, has said. I think uh, he has very well uh, set the scene for where we are at, uh, at a very important moment on the TTIP negotiations. Perhaps if I may, however, take one step back uh, from TTIP, because I think that uh, trade is in the DNA of the European Union. We are strongly committed uh, to openness uh, in trade policy. TTIP is a very important agreement, but it's by no means all the trade agenda of the European Union. First of all, uh, we are strong supporters of the WTO as an institution. And we think that after Nairobi, we are at an extremely important uh, moment for the World Trade Organization, where we think we need to see how we can develop uh, together a forward-looking forward uh, trade agenda. We are obviously negotiating what we hope would be a transformative agreement with the United States, but we are also actively engaged uh, in trade negotiations in countries in Asia and in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And of course, we are also very committed to strengthen economic integration with our closer neighbors, countries in the Arab world, Turkey, and of course, uh, Ukraine. But it's clear that I would want to concentrate mostly on the TTIP. What we are very convinced is that uh, we need to be able to succeed uh, TTIP at a high level of ambition. We launched this exercise uh, very much with a strong uh, consciousness of both the economic and the strategic importance of TTIP. And at the end of the day, even if the political context of trade is very challenging, 
both in Europe and in the United States. I think it's very important that as we enter into this uh, pivotal phase of the negotiations, we do not lose sight of what we want uh, to achieve. I mean, I'm not going to enter into the details of the negotiations, that's not uh, the purpose now, but just to simplify, for us, uh, TTIP should be able to achieve four objectives. First, we need to be ambitious on market access. We need to be able to resist the protectionist pressures and, and give a good example transatlantically, and that would inevitably imply looking into some issues which are sensitive in Europe and some issues which are sensitive in the United States. Secondly, regulatory cooperation is at the core of TTIP. This is probably what uh, Pascal Lamy mm, referred to when he talked about the 21st century trade agreement. And TTIP is an opportunity to create a strong basis for a partnership between the United States and the European Union on regulatory issues. Thirdly, there is a rules element. TTIP is an opportunity for the United States and the European Union to work together on rules for the 21st century on issues like digital trade, on issues like uh, trade on raw materials and energies, on issues like state-owned enterprises. And the more that we can converge together on those issues, the more that we should also be able to have an influence on the development uh, of global rules beyond the pure the bilateral context. And TTIP, I think, is also an opportunity to broaden the constituency in support of open trade both in Europe and uh, in the United States, there are increasingly critical voices about globalization. There are increasingly critical voices about uh, trade agreements. And that's why we see that a strong uh, rules on issues like labor, the environment, anti-corruption are an integral part of the agreement that we want uh, to negotiate. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, and I will very much agree that uh, we are very committed to try as much as possible to see where it's possible to conclude uh, the agreement uh, still uh, this year. It's going to be challenging. There's a lot of work and a lot of difficult issues that would need uh, to be decided. Finally, just a few words uh, on the issue of the global relevance of uh, TTIP. I mean, TTIP is, of course, a bilateral negotiation, but we also think uh, it can have a global impact, a global relevance. And there are three issues that, from our point of view, can enhance uh, this global significance of TTIP. The first one, I have already mentioned, is working together in the WTO to see how to develop a forward-looking trade agenda. Secondly, it is true that one of the things that we are going to do in TTIP is to reinforce bilateral cooperation on regulatory issues. But this should go together with joint work uh, by the United States and the European Union to strengthen those international organizations which are responsible for regulatory matters. And finally, we think that it will be important to design the TTIP as an open agreement, an agreement that countries we have shared the level of ambition should be in a position to, to join. And of course, from the European perspective, we are looking particularly into countries which already have a high level of economic integration with the European Union, and we have signaled their interest in this respect, uh, like Turkey or Norway. So I think I would leave it at, the, at there, and very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, excellent. Um, uh, and optimistic as well. Um, we're going to turn now to uh, uh, Friedrich Mertz, who's the chairman of the uh, excellent Atlantic uh, Bridge right. um, organization. Um, and I'm sure you're, you know, you, you've prepared some remarks, but I suppose the, the question top of my mind is how important is this deal for that bridge? Okay, thank you. First of all, let me say that um, Atlantic Brücke is an NGO, but uh, one of the very few NGOs who are in favor for something and not against everything. So this is what we are trying to do with our work. And um, we find that, and Michael uh, pointed out this case, that this agreement is far more than just economics. It's a question of strategic cooperation between Europe and the United States of America. Um, by the way, bilateral agreements are always second best. But unless we are not able to have global agreements, we should at least try to achieve regional agreements, and that is what you are doing in the US with some more parts in the world than just one, and we are doing here in this part of the world with one. 
That is the United States of America. So for my, for my perspective or our perspective, uh, we are confronted with fears and with, well, people who are trying to interpret this agreement with some details who are not the truth. Um, let me just uh, quote what uh, Wolfgang Ischinger said when he opened this conference in the afternoon. He quoted Fritz Stern, uh, saying that we are living in an era of fears. I would go even further. We are living in an era of anxieties. And people are not willing to accept that we have to change so many things that we are able to keep our wealth in our countries for the future. And that's the reason why we are in favor of a good agreement between the America and the European Union. Um, I would like to point out two, two issues or two aspects. The one is reducing tariffs is simple. And that is not the key message of this agreement. Reducing tariffs is good and necessary, but tariffs are not playing such a key role between the United States and Europe that it makes this effort necessary. It's worthwhile, but it's not key. Technological development and technical standards it's, is much more important. And when I'm hearing and listening to the debate, which are mainly uh, done in the German-speaking part of the European Union, we are not confronted with this resistance in France, even though the French are always uh, suspected to be against free trade, but you don't hear any protests in France. We are not confronted with protests from the United Kingdom. We are confronted with protests out of the German-speaking part of the European Union, and that is Germany, that is Austria, and that is Luxembourg. So, to the German-speaking part of the audience, technological cooperation between the United States and Europe is something which is more or less copied from our experiences we made in the early 90s in the internal market program of the European Union. I was member of the European Parliament then and spent 20 years in parliaments, five in the European and 15 in the German Bundestag. And I'm feeling reminded with all the arguments we heard, partly with the same words, more than 20 years ago, when we implemented the internal market program in Europe. And this was about technical cooperation and development of technical standards within the internal market program of the European Union on the same level we are trying to do now with some different aspects, but in general it's the same with the United States of America. And this brings us so many more competitiveness within this global world that we should not miss the opportunity of having such an agreement between the European Union and the United States now. And what makes me optimistic in the election campaign year of the United States is the fact that in 1992, you were able in the United States to achieve the NAFTA agreement. This was an election campaign year. And the year after, the successor, Clinton, brought it through Senate and Parliament in the United States. So this could happen again in the election year 2016. But there is one issue. 2017 might be easy for the United States, but it will become extremely complicated for the European Union. We will not only have general elections in Germany and in France, we will have the necessity to get this agreement through 28 national parliaments and the European Parliament, because very likely it will be a mixed agreement so that the national parliaments will have to agree. This challenges the political leaders to strong leadership on what we want to achieve with this agreement between the United States of America and Europe. Thank you very much. Um, Mauro Vieira, um, the uh, Minister for External Relations um, for Brazil. Um, when you look at this from Latin America, does it look as inclusive as um, um, our previous speakers have suggested? 
or potentially inclusive? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like, first of all, to thank all the organizers of the Munich Security Conference for this invitation for me to this prestigious panel. And I would like to start saying that Brazil is very much engaged in trade and diplomacy, of course, cooperation and integration. Uh, we have been working with our neighbors and with our other countries in the world to establish a network of trade uh, agreements. And we have uh, been working very closely with the European Union too. We have a TTIP uh, between uh, the European Union and uh, Mercosur country. We are just in the middle of the, the final steps uh, prior to the exchange of offers, which we hope will take place soon, uh, till March. Uh, we have had a number of different meetings with the European Union, with the, the Commissioner Malmström and other uh, the members, and we are very hopeful that this agreement will... Uh, the, the kickoff to, to the negotiations will take place soon with the exchange of offer. From our side, it's a very important agreement too. It's very inclusive. And uh, we uh, believe that this is uh, in the interest of, of course, of the European Union too. We uh, have in Mercosul, the four Mercosul countries, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil, who are taking part in this negotiation, represent a very important uh, market and we have, the European Union is the first trade partner of uh, Mercosur and to, uh, of Brazil too, as a bloc, and of Mercosur. And Mercosur is also an agricultural powerhouse. We are big exporters of agricultural good, goods. And that's why we believe that the, and we have always defended uh, the World Trade Organization as the its uh, central role in international trade. We have just had in December, and Mike Froman was there. We spent maybe two or three nights in a row without sleep discussing uh, the, the final communique and the decisions that were adopted. We believe that uh, WTO is essential to promote fair trade between nations. And I think that the uh, mechanism of WTO, the, the most favored nation clause and the consensus decisions, this uh, makes WTO a very important and central point because th through this mechanism, uh, fair trade and good trade will be taken to all different countries and will be good to all countries, small or big and powerful. We uh, believe that uh, and our examples are very, the, the examples we have in Mercosur are very important. Till 2019, the whole South America will be, will have free trade agreements with Mercosur. We'll have, uh, with Chile, for instance, we have already uh, zero uh, uh, tariffs. And we'll be at a total uh, free trade in 2019, which is something that sometimes is not very much mentioned in the press or is, very not, uh, is not very much known by the, the public opinion. I think that it's very, very important. And trade is seen from our side as a very important tool, uh, tool to promote inclusiveness, to promote uh, social inclusion, and to uh, promote prosperity. I have here some um, data from World Trade Organization and the World Bank on a report that was issued last year, the role of trade in ending uh, poverty. The conclusions presented are very straightforward. The expansion of international trade has been essential to development and to poverty reduction. And there are two figures that are very important. Since 2000, the year 2000, the developing countries' share of world trade increased from 33% to 48%. While the number of people in extreme poverty, just to take Latin America and our region as an example, uh, fell from 12% to 4.3%. Uh, this is why we think that uh, uh, trade is very, very important. That's why 
we believe trade should have a parameter at WTO. And of course, we, we have developed and we have trade uh, relations with other countries uh, bilaterally, regionally, or plurilaterally, and of course, uh, within the, the, the multilateral trade system, which we are very much uh, engaged in protecting and, development, and developing. And finally, I would like just to mention that um, uh, for us, the, the, uh, a balanced treatment of between agricultural and non-agricultural goods in terms of international trade is top important. Uh, all, these, um, all these issues have always been tackled by the Brazilian government. President Rousseff is very, very much engaged in promoting uh, trade. We have developed a number of different instruments that we have negotiated bilaterally and regionally like the Cooperation and Facilitation Investment Agreement. And we, um, have also, uh, we have also reached so far very important agreement in very different industrial sectors too. So we look to uh, TTIP with great expectations. We think it's very important, the two largest uh, economic blocks in the world and we think that we can all profit from it when it's based and negotiated under the rules of WTO. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to turn last, but of course uh, not least, to uh, President uh, Thomas Ilves uh, from the Republic of Estonia. Um, what are we to make of this? How does it fit in the the geopolitical um, game that we're uh, playing across the Atlantic? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is I, I mean, I'll just start off by saying, uh, to me, TTIP is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, I mean, it's 40% of the world's economy is either in the United States or in Europe, and 30% of the economies of that region, um, I mean, is based on transatlantic trade. And finally, though I hate reciting statistics, but uh, basically we can predict a 28% increase in, in the GDP of the, or in the economies based on TTIP going through. So, I mean, from an economic point of view, it really is a no-brainer, and there's no reason not to do it. The problem, I would argue, is that it is precisely in the kind of political uh, mood and the political mood, you have this sort of bizarre constellation that we see in Europe today, which is a renationalization of attitudes, uh, sort of, I mean, I, the, right, the rise of a populist right and a populist left at the extremes that are against uh, free trade. Uh, it fits in with you know, anti-immigrant attitudes. I mean, this is all, I mean, it's kind of like a Wittgensteinian cluster concept of backwardness, which is that you know you, you don't like immigrants, you don't like your neighbor, you don't like you, you don't like the European project, and you really don't like the United States. And in this anti-globalist atmosphere, anti-American atmosphere, anti-foreigner atmosphere, anti-EU atmosphere. Uh, both the hard right and the hard left have come together, which shouldn't be really that surprising to us, but we do see a level of opposition today um, that is, um, well, that is, is going to be a, a hard one to overcome. Uh, countries like mine, I would say small, literal, and not, not as literal as coast, I mean, <clears throat> we have a tradition of being pro-free trade. I mean, we were in the Hanseatic League 800 years ago. Uh, so we like trade. I mean, we think trade is good. Uh, but some, uh, say, countries with less of or no coastline, uh, this is maybe another way of saying what Herr Merz said, they have, um, they have a different view on trade, and this is one of the problems. But in every single country, there is this, there is, this attitude exists. Uh, Three million people across Europe have signed an anti 
free uh, anti TTIP petition. There's a lot of people. I mean, it's not it's not insignificant. And within countries, there has there is considerable opposition. Less than mine. We only had three thousand signatures, and which is small even for us. Um, but the, these are the, 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 it's a mood issue, and on the other hand, uh, I very much see that a strengthening of, of liberal values, not only in trade, but in democracy and in governance and openness, not only in trade, but openness with respect to general sort of transparency. Um, that's a good thing, and the enemies, I mean, to take a Karl Popper point of view. I mean, it's the, we're open societies, and open societies have enemies, and either be they racist, be they imperialist, be they aggressive countries, be they you know, homophobic. I mean, all of these things, uh, these things are, are sort of basically welling up, and we have that problem. Uh, and I see very much a TTIP as part of of <clears throat> undergirding, reinforcing the transatlantic relationship. And after all, these are primarily the, the big groups in the world that stand for liberal democracy. Um, thank you. Um, and a very good theme. Uh, uh, there is, I mean, in a room like this, as you say, um, most people I suspect would say, uh, these things are no-brainers. Um, the question, though, is whether the, the populist uh, backlash tells us something about, not just about the demagogues of right and left, but actually about some genuine concerns that people have. And I'd like to, to put a question to, uh, uh, to Ambassador Froman, which is when you get into these sort of trade agreements, which are really about regulation and norms, um, you're moving into areas of where you're talking about cultural preferences, whether about how food is um, treated, how we look at privacy, um, how far we apply the precautionary principle to regulation. And, you know, these are nations define themselves in many ways by their cultural preferences as well as their, their sort of all the other sort of uh, trappings of a state. How do you basically get a fair agreement which respects the fact that there is quite a lot of diversity, not just within Europe, but also in the US? I mean, the US has its own views, of course, on, on these matters. How do you strike that balance? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's important to see that as time has gone on, the global economy has changed, the nature of trade uh, has changed, and as traditional forms of protection have declined over the successive WTO round, GATT rounds and then WTO rounds, um, as we've talked about, for example, as tariffs have declined, um, new barriers have sometimes arisen. And it's not correct to say taking on issues like non-tariff barriers isn't really about trade because it is. Now having said all that, I very much agree that there are elements of, of culture and tradition. Um, there are different perspectives on regulation that need to be respected. And take TTIP as an example. Uh, none of us have an interest in TTIP being deregulatory, mm -hmm. in lowering the level of standards in either the US or in Europe, uh, in preventing uh, regulators from uh, in maintaining a level of protection for health, safety, and the environment that our people have uh, uh, come to expect. That's not what TTIP is about. It's about seeing whether, since both US and EU regulators oftentimes get to similar solutions but by different means, whether we can find ways of bridging the differences in their approaches so that a small and medium-sized business in uh, in, in Bavaria doesn't have to maintain two completely different product production lines or to meet two completely different standards in a costly way or test their product multiple times or be subject to redundant inspections. But it's not about lowering the level of protection or preventing either side from regulating. Neither the US or the EU would ever, I imagine, enter into an agreement where we're giving up our sovereignty to, to regulate uh, as we see fit. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't certain rules of the road. I mean, take, uh, you mentioned uh, 
um, uh, some uh, food-related issues, there are WTO disciplines around what we call sanitary and phytosanitary standards, the, the rules regulating food safety. And they suggest that sanitary and phytosanitary standards ought to be based on science. We think that's a pretty good principle, and that if each of us apply science, uh, however our scientists decide is appropriate, that that is, a, uh, uh, is, a, is a, uh, an appropriate way of, of, uh, of maintaining certain disciplines while reflecting uh, different approaches. Is that mutual recognition of standards rather than single standards? I, I think it's a very good point. I, I think the, the, there are various ways we could approach this. One would be harmonizing standards, which I think is very difficult mm -hmm. to do. Neither one of our regulators uh, are particularly interested in giving up their way of regulating for the other. Uh, but there are ways of determining, well, is the outcome achieve an equivalent level of safety, for example? And even if we get there through different ways, can we recognize certain standards as achieving uh, an, equivalent, uh, an equivalent outcome? I think there's also the possibility through TTIP uh, where we're seeing our regulators uh, working very closely with each other as they explore new issues, take on new issues, and are going to have to regulate issues that neither one of them have dealt with before, having greater cooperation and dialogue so that we manage to, if we can, avoid unnecessary divergences. That's the kind of progress we think we can see. Um, Mr. McCarrick, do you think that um, the Commission's doing enough? I mean, uh, Mr. Mertz said, uh, you know, about the the backlash in Germany, but actually I see it in the UK as well, where where it's two things get conflated. You get the, from the left, you get this is a deal done by the corporates mm -hmm. for the corporates, and then you get uh, underlying that, you know, this is, you know, challenging the way that, you know, we um, we regulate our food production and, and uh and our, our concepts of privacy, et cetera. So, I mean, has the Commission sold this well enough? Uh, well, perhaps uh, let me start by saying that I totally agree with what Ambassador Froman has said uh, in terms of the approach that we are developing in TTIP uh, on how we tackle regulatory issues. And I think it is very critical that everything that we have been doing uh, on regulation is very much based on the principle not to lower the protection that has been democratically decided in Europe or in the United States, and to see what is the scope to save costs, to avoid unnecessary duplication, and maybe sometimes we are willing to harmonize upwards, but never to harmonize downwards. Now, on the question of uh, selling the, uh, TTIP, first point which I wanted to make, the political challenges of selling open trade agreements is not a particular European issue. There are very similar uh, challenges in the United States. But I was listening to President Ice and hearing about the criticisms about uh, globalization, migration, mm -hmm. populists on the right, populists on the left. I think I can also see a political debate taking place in the United States, although the United States is not focused on TTIP, it's focused on a different uh, agreement. So I think both in Europe and in the United States, we have in the current uh, difficult economic uh, situation a difficulty in terms of convincing the, uh, our population about the values of free trade. And I think that that's something that requires a strong commitment by political authorities at all levels. The Commission has been doing a lot. I can assure you that Commissioner Manson spends a lot of her time traveling around uh, Europe, talking to, to the public, talking to the national parliaments. But let's be very clear, it cannot be a job which is done by the Commission alone. It has to be also national politicians who have to intervene and who have to be able to explain why this is a deal that matters economically and that matters strategically. Of course, at this point in time, it's a serious, a very abstract debate because TTIP is not there. It has not yet been concluded. We are much more confident that once TTIP is done and once one is able to point out exactly what TTIP means because the text will be there, it should be possible to show that a lot of the fears which are being expressed do not correspond to a reality. Yeah. Okay. Now look, all our speakers are agreeing with each other, which means I failed as a moderator. Uh, <laughs> we just chose so the wrong people. I'm now going to pass over the task of uh, sowing division and discord uh, to you. I've been um, uh, told that one of the uh, Munich Young Leaders um, has a question, comment, so we're going to start with, um, with him. It's the gentleman there, and then we'll um, throw it open. Thanks to this great panel. 
Uh, my question is, you know, weaponization of trade and finance, I mean politically motivated sanctions and anti-sanctions, uh, what uh, impact it will have on global economy and global security in this very difficult environment? It will force Russia to uh, stop invading countries, perhaps, and I would say far better than uh, a nuclear war, I would shut, I mean, I, if that's the option of further Russian aggression, I would say turn off SWIFT, that saves a lot more lives. So yes, it has a role, I mean, uh, it, it forced Iran to the table, however it's going to f force the Anschluss, uh, the illegal annexation and incorporation of Crimea uh, to be reversed, I don't know, but I hope it works, because it's better than having a war. Okay, let's take, um I'll maybe take two or three in one go, and then we can try and get a discussion going. So this gentleman here, and then the one behind. Alexei Semeny from Ukraine. I have actually two short questions, firstly to both ambassadors, because previously we talked about TPP, which U.S. has concluded. Now we're talking about TTIP, which probably is going to be concluded this year. To what extent do coincide both very comprehensive agreements, 200%, 90%, 80%? And for example, for United States, whether it will be the case, then both agreements will be automatically in force if they coincide. And then the question uh, to um, uh, Mr. Vassero, actually it is about, you've told about the case that if the TTAP will be concluded, then it will be some implications for the other partners of EU, for example, Turkey with customs union or Ukrainian with DCFTA. So it will be automatically transferred these agreements to these countries or it will be some kind of details. Okay, and then the gentleman back there. Mikko Tari from Mercat Institute for China Studies in Berlin. Um, there's a big um, elephant in the room, which is China, of course, and I would like to ask two gentlemen in the middle. Uh, first, um, is TTIP also part of the big game in terms of um, not letting China write the rules of global trade? Uh, second, more specifically, China is going to have, or probably will see, a market economy status in 2016. What precise ways are there to coordinate a European and US answer on this issue? Thank you. Okay, do we have another one? Yes. And then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you. My name is Hannah Tete. I'm the foreign minister from Ghana. Um, my question is, with reference to the TTIP, what implication does it have for Europe's agreements with other regions within the ACP group, the Economic Partnership Agreement, following from what um, the gentleman from Ukraine was asking as well? How is that going to impact the way that we move forward? Because going through this process of getting those agreements has been hell. And if we now have to have additional variations, I shudder to think what that will look like. Okay, let's keep this free flowing. So whoever wants to chip in and um, give a... First or you want... No, you go. Okay. I'll, take, I'll take the questions panel. that I like and I'll leave the rest to Ignacio. Uh, uh, first of all, of, of course, since uh, we're not done with TTIP, it's hard to say what the percentage overlap is between TPP and, and TTIP. Uh, it, they don't necessarily need to be identical, but obviously we're dealing with many of the same issues and um, uh, we'll be able, some of the issues are more relevant uh, to the US-E relationship, other issues are less relevant. And so I think that's a work, uh, work in progress. Our goal overall, as we did in TPP, is we, we, through TPP, we worked with our partners to establish new high standards in various areas and to raise standards or uh, put in place reforms in other areas. We'd like to do the same with TTIP so that we're in each agreement we are raising the standards that could ultimately um, uh, play a role in encouraging uh, the multilateral system uh, as well. I think on just to the the China um, uh, the China question, you know, uh, there are many regional and many regional efforts underway right now. There's the there's the Eurasian uh, economic area. There's uh, RCEP. There's the One Belt One Road initiative. There are uh, bilateral agreements being negotiated uh, between Australia and China, Australia and uh, Korea. Those are two recent ones between China and Korea. That's another recent one between China and other parties. So uh, TPP and TTIP are not the only sub-multilateral agreements 
uh, going on. From our perspective, uh, uh, TPP and, uh, as Ignacio said, TTIP are intended to be platforms to which other countries could potentially join if they uh, can and are able and willing to achieve the high standards, and we all agree that it makes uh, a sense. Uh, in my own view in China, whether or not it's ever part of a broader agreement, it will have to live in a TPP world uh, where its neighbors are offering higher standards. And that, in our view, will also help encourage them to raise their standards as well, to raise their game. And that's in all of our interests. Um, no, just simply to, to add a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, TPP is an agreement uh, among countries at very different levels of development. It is a very ambitious agreement. TTIP is an agreement uh, negotiated between two highly developed uh, economies uh, with a strong uh, regulatory regimes. So inevitably, the outcome of the negotiations is going to be different. There will be some areas of commonality, but I think there will also be areas of difference, not of incompatibilities, but simply, I think, we probably would be able to go beyond uh, the ambition of uh, TPP in TTIP in a number of areas, but we are still negotiating, so until we have concluded the negotiations, we cannot say what the outcome, what the outcome would be. I would like perhaps to clarify my statement uh, about uh, TTIP as an open uh, platform. Now, that doesn't mean, obviously, that all the agreements that we have negotiated need to be adjusted, or that all countries of the world will have the ambition of joining the TTIP. I think, as I said, it's going to be a very high standard agreement, we would need to see which particular countries have the motivation and the interest to work to that high standard of agreement. In terms of countries that have come to us uh, and we have indicated uh, that they are interested in this perspective, it is basically Turkey, which has a custom union with us, and because of that, it has a particular uh, challenge when we negotiate uh, free trade agreements uh, with third countries. It is also Norway and perhaps some other countries in Europe. So far, we have not received any such signal from Ukraine. So, I mean, I hear your question, but we have not received such a signal coming, to, coming, to, coming to from the from the from Ukraine. Now, uh, I think that uh, certainly TTP is something which is not against anyone. It is aiming to develop, uh, uh, together with the United States, uh, better rules uh, to cooperate in regulation. We think that by working together, we can have better influence, but it's certainly not an agreement which is being uh, negotiated against any, 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 any country. Now, on the issue of MES, is something which uh, the Commission is currently doing an impact assessment. Uh, once an impact assessment uh, will be concluded, we would need to take a decision about how to tackle, to, about how to tackle that matter. Finally, one comment uh, on the, the EPAs. As I said, there's no question of renegotiating the EPAs because of TTIP, so don't worry. There's no idea on that. All the economic studies, by the way, that have been done about TTIP show that when it comes to low-income countries, TTIP is basically neutral. It doesn't have a negative impact on low-income on low income, on low income countries. Mm -hmm. um, Minister, what about middle-income countries? Globally speaking, the economic analysis which has been done uh, doesn't show... Sick oh, sorry, you were asking the... Yeah, no, I was just... Uh, I, was just uh, I, I was trying to be provocative. Sorry, sorry, I, 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 I shut up, I shut up. I think I should, I should listen to the minister. Well, middle-income countries or developing countries or emerging countries, of course, are very much interested in, in those uh, new um, agreements. Uh, Brazil has always been very much engaged in all uh, agreements that were proposed to us. And uh, we, what we believe in, in our region, I can speak for Mercosul and for South America, what we believe is that uh, uh, the, the agreement should be compatible uh, with WTO rules. We don't want to see new rules or new patterns of uh, of any kind to become new barriers. That's why we are very much engaged in WTO. That's why we made such a huge effort in December in Ghana to save WTO and to approve a declaration that uh, meant a very important step forward in terms of ending agricultural uh, subsidies and also um, uh, keeping 
all the, uh, the, the important issues that were relevant to uh, developing countries in Latin America and in Africa, as uh, we did. And we, of course, uh, we have always favored multilateralism in all uh, sense, uh, the, in, in, in terms of uh, in the trade, the multilateral trade system, and also politically. And uh, with a reference to sanctions, we uh, do not uh, believe sanctions are uh, the best way to, to resolve a problem. But we followed every sanctions that were approved at the United Nations, commercial sanctions uh, uh, approved by the Security Council. Some of those uh, imposed this, uh, big losses to us in terms of trade, but we respected because they were approved uh, in the multilateral system. And that's why we want uh, to uh, follow and to have our own negotiations, trade negotiations regionally or multilaterally, but always with a view to keeping and safeguarding WTO. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Froman has to leave, I'm, uh, I'm told. Um, so if, you, if you'd like, I'm told that you, you have to yep. leave. If you'd like to, we could say thank you very much, but we're, the rest of us will stay and promise to be polite about the United States <laughs> after <laughs> you've gone. But if we could thank Ambassador Froman. You have to go as well? You have to go as well? Yeah, I've got the talk. Oh. Okay. I thought you... Well, if you can... Come on, four minutes. come on. Four or five four minutes. minutes, come on. <laughs> um, would you like to... Um, Mr. Most, would you like to... Well, I would like to give one comment on this, on this debate. We'll and, and the, in, in my view, there is one key element of this treaty, which is, so to say, a unique selling point compared to all, the other, all other uh, agreements on trade, and that is regulatory cooperation between the United States and Europe. This goes deep into the competencies of governments and even more into the competencies of parliaments. And I think the EU Commission has to make clear at any time of these negotiations, until the final round of negotiations, that parliaments, be it the national parliaments or, depending on the competencies, the European Parliament on this side and the Senate, the Congress on the other side, have always the last word to say on regulatory issues. If that is not the case, it will be extremely hard to get the majority in parliaments to vote in favor for this agreement. I know how parliamentarians work and how they are under pressure from their constituencies. And if we are having and facing elections next year and beyond, it is really important after uh, at the very beginning, the, it happened a, a big mistake when the EU Commission and the Council, the European Council, were not willing to publish the mandate. But this has happened, and you can repair it. But at the very end, it is extremely important to get the support of at least a majority in parliaments, national and European parliaments in the European Union. And this is only possible if you really point out every day and every minute that parliamentarians will not be overruled with something what is in this treaty negotiated between the US and Europe. Thank you. President Ilves, the last word. Okay, I'll say something that will disrupt things in a moment. But first I'll say, one of the things I've noticed in this entire debate is as knee-jerk European reaction to so-called looser standards in, uh, in in the United States, uh, and I and when I have these discussions, I don't have many, but I mean when people make these oh, no, statements from my country, is that in fact, <clears throat> for a, a variety of reasons, I actually know about something such as hydro hydrogenated emulsified vegetable fats, also known as trans fats. The FDA banned them. They are not banned except at a national level in the EU. So it is not as if we're going to now all give up our standards in the European Union because the agreement with the bad Americans. In fact, I would say on certain issues, 
the US, except for example on trans fats, is much better than Europe is. So anyway, but the big thing that I would say that's wrong with TTIP is that it's, <clears throat> I find it insufficiently ambitious in that um, the economy of the future is going to be more and more digital. And digital protectionism, I see, is one of the biggest threats in Europe today. And why it is a one of, <clears throat> such a big threat is that protectionism, uh, hitherto, ever since there's been protectionism, has been a linear process. That is, if you protect yourself, you will fall behind, but in a linear fashion. With Moore's Law, if you start protecting European IT companies against competition from the United States and with Moore's Law, which is exponential, <clears throat> we will no longer fall behind linearly, we will fall behind exponentially. Thank you um, very much, and uh, thanks to all of our panelists. It's always struck me um, on the same note as Thomas has said, we, we don't mind eating chlorinated chickens when we go to the United <laughs> States, but we don't, for some reason, don't want to eat them in Europe. I've never quite understood that. But, um, and as I found out today, we do eat chlorinated lettuce from Europe. Right. Um, but um, I'm sorry we can't continue the, the, the conversation, but um, we've got to wrap up. But um, uh, despite my dismal failure to provoke um, uh, discord, I think it's been a really interesting uh, conversation. So can we thank the panelists? <laughs>